Hello everybody, welcome back to This Weird House. I am, as always, Nick Botic, and today we have a very special guest, someone I've been looking forward to talking to for a while now. He has written, well, we'll get into all that. I'm here with Mr. Troy Young. How are you, sir? I am well, thank you, sir, for having me on. Absolutely. So uh, I'm just going to dive right into it. You are the author of, well, first off, you're the author of a lot of books. Yes. And you're one of those authors that I'm just like... I don't know how long you've been writing, but whenever I see someone with more than like six full length books, I'm just like, I don't, how I have one novel and I worked on it for like three years. I don't understand how people do it. (laughs) Uh, I I was lucky enough to be working from home during the pandemic and had time on my hands. For sure. Um, I think that's the case for, for quite a few people. (laughs) Yeah. So my, my productivity has dropped off significantly. (laughs) <laughs> uh, once real life concerned. started yeah 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 so. um but the uh specific books i want to talk to you about are the ones that are most germane to the overall topic of this podcast your other series um and really before we get into those books specifically i just i'm curious what your introduction to horror was have you been a lifelong fan did you discover it through movies through uh, books? how I, did you come to you this you know genre? what to be honest i wouldn't even have considered myself a fan of horror um really yeah i mean growing up as a kid i watched the 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 nightmare on elm streets and the the um friday the 13th movies but i they were okay I wasn't something I gravitated to. I never really read Stephen King or, you know, Clive Barker or any of those um, uh, authors. I did get introduced to Lovecraft, though, through Call of Cthulhu, the the, okay. the role-playing game. I played a lot of role-playing games um, as a kid, specifically, you know, Dungeons and & Dragons and things like that. We branched out into Shadowrun and into Battletech. So it was all through the role-playing games. And then somebody I, I knew, I kind of just was introduced to, said, hey, I run Call of Cthulhu. And I'm like, well, what the hell is that? He goes, well, it's a horror game. And I'm like, eh, all right, I'll give it a try. So, and I liked it, right? But even still, I don't think I really got into reading Lovecraft. So I, I started playing Call of Cthulhu in about, like, say, 96. Probably never got around to reading Lovecraft until 2002. Oh, wow. um, ended up collecting a, pretty much all of his works through ver- various books that I found at used bookstores. Um, and then it was pretty intense with both the 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 role-playing game and reading Lovecraft stuff from about like 2002 to I'd say about 2007. And then it kind of just went back on the shelf, but it always lingered in the back of my head, right? Like I was more into Robert E. Howard's Conan and stuff like that. Yeah. Growing up, like that was my first introduction really to fantasy, sword and sorcery, all of that, that pulp fiction. And I know, um, you know, Howard and Lovecraft had a very uh, interesting dynamic and relationship where they would uh, communicate back and forth. They would share ideas. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that was written in the Conan world, which is is almost Lovecraftian influence. Like, I, I think people even suggest that they're in the same mm-hmm. world, right? Um, yeah. So that was kind of my introduction, but it had been put aside. I started to write uh, total, not in horror at all. I would never even considered becoming a horror author. I fell into this. And it's an interesting story. Um, I started one day, was in in Florida visiting my parents and went for a walk. They just put in new sidewalks in their area, which had never existed so it was conducive for me going for a long walk in the hot florida sun and i think i got delirious because while i was walking i came up with this idea about a guy who lived in a trailer park who ends up winning a huge lottery and he was unemployed living with his mother him and his loser friends he had no vision no whatever he wanted and suddenly this money opens up and he decides he's running for senate and he'd be so there's there's already three books in that series it was originally going to be called florida man but then i realized that that name comes with the connotation of like absolute insanity um and i almost did it at like i was going to have him buy a monster truck and open up a gun range and all this stuff but i cleared that out 
he became much more cerebral. Um, and anyway, I'm, I'm in the middle of writing the fourth book of that, but the current political situation has just ground that to a halt in my head because <laughs> I just can't deal. But anyway, um, so I wrote that first. And I, I'd literally come back and was talking to my staff. I'm the CEO of a not-for-profit organization. So I was talking to my staff about the story I came up with while wandering around the heat in Florida and probably getting sunstroke. And one of my staff, whose mother actually worked at Simon & Schuster Canada, said, well, when are you going to stop just telling us about these stories you've got ideas for and write it? So I did, just despite her. Um, <laughs> so I wrote that, and I was trying to get a... Um, an agent for it. I did send it into Simon and Schuster. They really loved it, but didn't want to make it. So um, thought it was great. Thought I was, was writing well, but they just didn't see a market for it. Um, so I was thinking, I started then to learn about self-publishing. This is probably early 2019. I started to, to learn about that, but I didn't want to put my baby out that way. So I thought I should probably test the waters to see how the self-publishing process goes, right? Before I make a mistake with this book that I've worked on for so long. Um, so in, in 2019, early 2019, I just finished Neil Gaiman's The Graveyard Book. I picked it up in a little library. I'd never read Gaiman. For, all I knew of Neil Gaiman in 2019 was he's the guy that wrote that um, Sandman comic, which I never read. So that my was favorite that, of all that time. Was, that was my knowledge of Neil Gaiman. So I saw this book sitting in the little library and it was short. So I thought I, I'll read that. And I did, and I loved it. So I've read a bunch of Gaiman since then, but I can honestly say, I know he, he's kind of persona non grata at the moment, but, uh, I would never have published or written any kind of horror if I hadn't read that. So that is, he is probably my biggest um, muse, I guess, because I based a character off of Jack of all trades. And it was just a little short story. It was only four pages long. And this is the first thing I ever published. And it's about this character. And he really has no sense of who or what he is. He has a magic knife that leaves no wounds and a notebook. And in the notebook, as he's flipping through, a name and an address will just appear. Basically, he, he's kind of an aspect of death. But like Jack of all trades, how there's multiple Jacks, he's the one of people that die in their sleep. So the idea is, though, that he shows up at your house and murders you with the knife that leaves no wounds. So it just goes, well, the person just died in their sleep. And of course, there's like a raven that shows up because of the, the, the Native American idea about the collecting the soul. So it was about him showing up at this random house and the raven is there. And it was through his whole process of what he goes through. You never actually see the killing. You never see anything like that. It just happens. The, the story ends with the raven cawing, basically signifying that it's happened. So I published this, you know, you can only do 99 cents. Uh, that's the lowest you can charge. Um, some of these short stories that I publish, I would actually sell for even less, but Amazon won't let you. So I threw it up there for 99 cents and it had a few sales. And then I decided to, they have an offer where you can do uh, up to seven days free. So I think I put five days of free and in five days of, I think I had it for sale for two days, put it up for five days of free. And within that first week sold or gave away over 500 copies of this short story. And I went, well, the self-publishing thing is easy. It's not so bad. <laughs> right? Why does everybody say this is difficult? 500 copies in a week. This is awesome. Um, so that was it. So then I was like, well, maybe I should write another type of, you know, horror suspense thriller type story so i was thinking i was walking my dog one night and i remembered a story from when i was a kid and this was a real occurrence uh my parents are from cape breton island so we were going down to visit them i live in toronto and i grew up in ontario so we were going down to visit 
Cape Breton Island. And I was about six at the time. And I think even still to this day, you can really only get CBC radio in that part of the world. So, but especially, you know, in 1977, when we were doing this, you could only get CBC radio. And there was a story of a sea monster that had washed ashore. And I was like, huh, that stuck with me. I kept having I images of a Godzilla type creature coming over the next hill and grabbing our car because it was literally repeated every 15 minutes on the radio station as we're driving. So I'm in the back seat of this car for a couple hours as we're approaching my grandparents' place. Ooh. Just freaking out, existential uh, crisis. A little bit. <laughs> Just hearing about this sea, this unknown sea monster washed up on a shore, washed up on a shore. So it turned out, because I remember sitting in my, my grandparents' um, kitchen, and a couple days later hearing the radio, because again, it's the same radio, the only one station that they had, um, going, oh, we determined that that unknown sea monster was a basking shark. It was just uh, particularly large and had been um, so, so decayed that they mm -hmm. couldn't identify it immediately. So I don't know why walking with my dog on a rainy night in March, this story came to my head and I thought I could write that from the perspective of what if the sea monster was real? So I went, okay. So the, oh, a sea monster is washed up on the shore of a small Cape Breton town, but it's a real sea monster. So that's how I, I kind of got that started. And I thought, well, I can get a marine biologist involved and get the RCMP involved. What would happen in this little town if this happened? And it was only as a fluke, I thought, you know what? I'm going to tie this back in to Lovecraft. I had, when I first thought of it, I wasn't going to. It was just going to be a strictly, this is it. It's a short little story about a sea monster. Um, and the only tie to Lovecraft in that first book was the main character, Dr. Del Kramer, makes a reference to the fact that she's got a colleague who works at Miskatonic University who studies aberrant, aberrant sea creatures who she's going to send these pictures that she's taken of this sea monster to, to see if he knows anything about it. And that's it. That's the only mention or tie to Lovecraft in that story. And the reason I did it is that I wanted to establish it in Lovecraft's world. And I thought uh, if I decided to promote this, I could promote the tie, right? To Lovecraft. There's yeah. Lovecraft fans out there. So I can say, Hey, here you go. It's a Lovecraft story without actually being a Lovecraft story. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I put that up and I published it. And again, holy crap, the response from people was amazing. It was going to be a one-off. Like that was it. One-off story. And then people are like, oh, I want more of this. I want more of these characters. I want more of what he's doing. And I was like, oh, okay. So that was It Came From The Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, so my next story that I wrote, I sat down, was called It Slumbers Beneath The Ice. And I set it up north of Alert in uh, Nunavut. And Alert is the, the the world's most northern community, right? So far, far north in the ice. This is where I introduced the concept of it being a, a government agency. So she gets, the Dr. Del Kramer gets recruited by this agency. I just kind of forced, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. To be in this agency. And people are like, oh, it's like X-Files. Oh, it's like Delta Green. It's like, possibly, I didn't know Delta Green even existed at the point when I wrote this. Um, and I'd never watched the X-Files, although I was aware, obviously, that X-Files was mm -hmm. a thing. Um, right. So I wrote that. And that's, uh, I, I expanded it by including a, a Cthulhu star spawn. That's what's in the ice, right? Hell yeah. I recognize it as soon as like the description starts in the book. I'm like, that's, yes, let's go. Yes. yes. So <laughs> I, I thought, okay, let's, let's further tie it into Lovecraft. So I did it with that. Um, and then people love that too. So I decided to use the RCMP officer, um, uh, Joe Mills. Um, and I wrote a different one set in Muskoka here in Ontario called it lives in the woods. 
and it, the 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 cabin that he goes to it is actually um, inspired by friends of mine's cottage who we go visit. <laughs> the way I described it, it that's that's their cottage. Um, mm. I think I called it Nine Mile Lake, and they live on Six Mile Lake. And I think yeah, it was just. I, I don't think they've actually read it and made the connection that it was their place I was talking about. <laughs> but yeah, again, so that became um, the idea of a, a, a hidden cult on this island, summoning creatures. And that one also was really well received. So I suddenly thought, okay, I've got something here. Maybe I should keep going and writing. Um, then I wrote the the next one, which uh, it hides in the village. And there's a, a reference to a town called Orno, which is actually where I grew up. And they actually go to a bake shop in it, which was like my favorite little spot to go have lunch. And I make re reference to the sausage rolls because that's what I would always get at that. So that's all real. The The town where the, the cult is hidden is not, although it's placed right where my parents used to live. Um, and I included one of the characters from It Slumbers Beneath the Ice and joined him up with Joe Mills from the first the first and the third one. So suddenly they're now all integrated. And it was only after I wrote the fourth one, and I introduced the cult is a cult uh, of Nerlathotep, that I suddenly went, okay, I've got the beginnings of a story arc here. And it was only by the fourth one that I developed the overall reaching story. But even then, I kind of thought it was going to be six stories and maybe done. Like, um, the last story of that first book is called It Ends Where It Began. And that was written potentially just to be the end. Like, I might not have gone any further. So I wasn't sure. And I was going to see how collectively the six of them went. Um, but by then I was starting to get enough feedback. I created a Facebook group. People were joining it. Suddenly I had fans, like people that were really into this and were talking about it. And then they would start to say things like, I think there's a, um, a little bit of a romantic spark there between Joe and Adele. And I'm like, really? Okay, fine. I'll give it to you. Uh, you know, fan <laughs> service. They think there's a romance angle. I'll give them. Well, it wasn't really a romance angle. They did hook up and then he, uh, sorry, he dies. Is that a spoiler? Um, I, I, I was going to say, so like, just so we can talk, speak freely and I can ask you all the questions I want to, yep. or I'm just going to put a blanket spoiler warning here. Oh. Like, if you're okay with talking about all of the books in their entirety, I'll put a just there will yeah, I, be spoilers. I, I don't here. mind because I don't think giving not even if I give things away, you still want to know how they get there. Like my daughter and I right now, I read to her every night, even though she's 14, I still read to her. It's weird. It's our little thing together. And we're reading Agatha Christie. And right now I'm, I'm reading an Agatha Christie story that we both know who the murderer is because I was thinking of incorporating this Agatha Christie story into one of my other stories, right? Cause I'm still writing them. Um, so I've done the research and I knew who the murderer was. So we talked about it. So she, we're, I'm reading it to her. She goes, this is the one that you were telling me about that this guy's, Oh yeah, yeah, it is. Oh geez. So we know who the murderer is, but we're still so confused about how this person ended up doing it. And we, we, we can't figure out the motive yeah. and the opportunity and all of that. So even though we know, it's still interesting. So I don't mind giving stuff away. So, yes, Joe died. The other guy, Pete, died. And I loved Pete. Adele goes off into uh, the great unknown to sit at the seat of Azathoth. That is one of my favorite endings to a book for a character ever. And I ever. Got, in all the great many horror books I've read. I got so and, much grief for that. Oh my God, really? Yes. People are like, I can't believe you killed them all off. I'm like, yo, he's a, he's a murderer. He's a saddest. What you? And I, but to me, that's like, okay, so you cared about these characters. The fact that you're mad that I did this means you cared about the characters, which means I did something right. 
Yeah. Um, but that to me was a, a holdover from playing um, Call of Cthulhu, the role playing game, because I learned very quickly don't get attached to your characters because <laughs> they either go insane or they die really, really quickly. So, so if, if I can cut you off, it's good that you say that because as it so happens, I am just now getting into Call of Cthulhu. Yeah. I've never been into tabletop stuff before and it like it's something that i know i'm gonna love it's just it's so complex like there's yeah. so many moving yeah. parts and like it's just daunting to learn but like, so people, don't get attached to my character okay i've had people get critical of my work saying well it it reads just like somebody's call of cthulhu campaign and i'm like well duh yeah it is um <laughs> It's it's literally individual scenarios using the same characters tied together to an overarching story. It's like, yeah. But is it a campaign that I ran? No, I haven't played Call of Cthulhu in over 20 years. So, no, um, it is not. Um, but it is structured very much like those episodes because they are episodic, right? The, each story has a, a reason for being, a start reason for them to be there, something that they've got to encounter and uncover. Everything is like a mystery or an investigation. Ah, big, bad, crazy things. Eh, I lose, I lose a little sanity and I move on right to the next one. I mean, how it's a departure from Lovecraft that way that, I mean, most of his stories were entirely contained and you didn't see the person ever again. Um, Randolph Carter keeps showing up a few times and there's, there's a few um, exceptions in his work to that. Um, but for the most part, yeah, it's none of his stories relate to one another. So this mm -hmm. is a departure from that. And it's not written in his style. Although I, I, there are two stories that I tried to write in his style. One is about the founding of the Department of Extraordinary Phenomena, which is a horrible name. And I know it's a horrible name. And the characters even say it's a horrible name a couple times, but it was founded in 1925. And if you go back and look at government records when they have certain things, they, they have stupid names like that. So it's just stuck because nobody's wanted to take the time to um, rename it. Um, so the, the, the thing in the customs house, which I actually use as a reader magnet for my um, newsletter list, is written more in Lovecraft's style. And the other one, um, the, the Lost, oh my God, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the actual title of my own book or my own story. Um, Pickman's Lost uh, Thing. The yeah, I know which one you're talking. Um, hang on, I got it like right here. I I should know these things. This is a a, um, a symptom of being 53. You start to lose your memory. <laughs> the misplaced uh, something. Oh wait, uh, da, 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 da. where is it? Where is it? The misplaced masterpiece of Richard Upton Pickman. Yes. That's yes. It. So that's written more from Lovecraft style because that's written as a series of um, journals by this guy who owns an art gallery and has managed to find this Picton, Pickman um, artwork that has slowly driven him insane. Right? So that that's a departure because in that one, the main characters are seen through this person's eyes, right? So I tried to, to mix them up, right? And, and most of the stories are set in Canada. There is a slight deviation where we at one point go to Egypt. Um, Hell yeah, there is. I love that arc, dude. That, that one is actually probably my favorite story. That or it, it slumbers beneath the ice. Those are the two that really resonate with me. Um, and then they're also in Edinburgh. Um, mm -hmm. Right. So that's the, the second one. And that's the Druid. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I did Edinburgh because I'd just recently been in Edinburgh at that time. And I really thought it was a cool city. And I thought I want to include it. Most of the places that I've written about, I've been to, right? So there, mm -hmm. Halifax shows up, 
Um, Quebec City shows up. Although I was just in Quebec City like three weeks ago, and I, I, I decided to, to track down where I had placed the um, <laughs> the sex shop where <laughs> the book is hidden in the wall. And um, I had talked about them driving up in a um, uh, like a fake electrical workers truck to park outside to do some work. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, that area is strictly a walking zone. <laughs> <What? laughs> I was like, oops. And I, I found there was actually another spot, the old port of Quebec city, which would have made more sense to put it in, mm. but too late. It's already in Petit Champlain and it, it's, it's stuck there now, but everything else works. So whatever. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I, we've, they've been to Calgary, which I've been to. My next story, which is it's, it's all done in here. It just hasn't been trans, transferred through my fingers onto the page. That's my next nine novels. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it's going to be in Victoria, BC. Okay. Um, but yeah, I have now been to every Canadian province and one territory. So it got that appeal but for some reason i can't get canadians to buy it most of my people that buy it and most of the fans are all americans so it's weird because they don't really know the localities and it's written in canadian english and nobody's ever said boo about that about there being extra use dropped into to words which yeah i about, i was it, gonna say it, it did jump out at me at one point i i can't say what made it do so but i all the pieces kind of came together. I was like, oh, okay. It takes place in Canada. It has this word. It used this thing. All these references to these things. I was like, okay. So this guy must be Canadian then. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So there's not too many Canadian Lovecraftian authors out there. So I thought I was in a niche. And um, yeah. Actually, it's funny. I, yeah. I, I like try to Google or use um, AI to do some research on who's out there writing Canadian cosmic horror and it listed a couple people so oh, these these are the the renowned ones and i i, I don't want to talk any smack but i cross-referenced them to their goodreads and their um amazon rankings to mine and i was way ahead of them so i'm like why isn't you know ai why aren't you popular? why is it saying yeah. i'm popular because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i got way more ratings than they do. um <laughs> So. Yeah, the uh, I I just I gotta put I don't think I emphasize this enough at at the top of this. I am such a huge fan of these stories of yours, like Thank you. the and just based on everything you've just said, like I just so specifically the ending I want to talk to you about was Adele's ending at uh, the end of the first book. Yes, where she is like I. <laughs> Actually, before I say that, sorry, I jump around a lot on this, so you mentioned writing in Lovecraft style. And I was going to say, that's one of the things I love most about your books is that they are written. It's giving me that Lovecraft fix that like I'm looking for in everything I'm reading when I'm in that sort of cosmic horror mood, but it's so much more accessible than actually like reading Lovecraft. I don't mind his style, the purple prose. Like I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting way of writing and storytelling, but like, it can be a bit much sometimes yeah. like your writing style is just so like it Ill, illustrative. Am I using the right word? I don't know. Like there's it's, I just, I can really picture what's going on and everything. And like that helped me connect as a reader um, just personally. And I like, you just nail that. Tried to keep it casual and kind of conversational. Mm -hmm. Um, my writing tends to have a lot more dialogue than a lot of other writers do. Mm -hmm. um, like when I run my stuff through editing software to help me edit it, and it does comparisons to other authors. Yeah, my amount of dialogue is probably about 10 to 20% more. Um, yeah. Because I think that to me is much more interesting. Like I, I will, I've been trying to read a lot of classics lately. So Kurt Vonnegut, I read Slaughterhouse Five and I'm in the middle of uh, The Sun Also Rises from Hemingway. And 
Boy, these are guys that spend a lot of time telling me what's going on mm -hmm. and describing, and I just get all oh. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> it, I, it does get to be a bit much, yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, yeah. And some people love that, and that's great. Uh, if if you're a reader that loves that, I'm not being yeah. um, derogatory towards you. I'm just talking about my style. So for me, I would rather just get a little sample a sprinkling of just enough background description to allow my imagination to take over, right? So I'll just give you the prompt and let you fill in the blanks rather than paint an entire canvas and go, there it is. Yeah. So because that's my approach, then the dialogue becomes much more. Um, and now people will talk about showing versus telling. And I, I try, I, I think I try to tell through the, the dialogue what's going on. Um, and sometimes it's a little hard to do when you've got multiple characters, especially to get that internal monologue. Because how do you switch between? So every story kind of has to be done from one person's dominant viewpoint. Yeah. And it can change based on which character I've decided to focus on in this. Because after, you know, Pete and Joe die and Adele goes off to Azathoth, I introduce a new character, right? Uh, Malcolm Mayweather. Malcolm. And he becomes the main character for pretty much all of the second book. Mm -hmm. It's really his story. And then I introduce a new character, Charlene. Charlene. Um and they're now partnered together. And he has a, a numerous partners through that second book and bad things usually happen to them. Yeah. Um, so he, uh, bad things happen to him too, man. Like this poor guy is, probably gets beaten up more than anybody else. I think he does. He loses an arm. He loses an arm. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, I gets there. trampled by a shug shugath. Yes. That's how it's uh, like <laughs> <right>? <laughs> His, his his introduction to Lovecraft is a, a Shoggoth um, um, exploding out of a burning building and knocking him over because he's a firefighter, right? Um, yeah, and yeah, gets cancer, loses an arm, just... Oh, that's right, I forgot. Yeah, he gets, like, extremely horrible cancer. I don't mean to laugh by saying that. It's just, yeah, you really put this guy through the ringer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And th that's... Uh... To find, I'm sorry, go ahead. to find out too at the end it was all for nothing it was just like a quirk whatever that was a that was a gut punch <laughs> yeah that was that was a genuine gut punch i was like damn well, dude that's because <laughs> i mean all my research into the different lovecraftian entities right always kind of got back to narlathotep because, you know, he's the Black Pharaoh, because he showed up in Egypt, he, he seems to be the one that has interacted the most with humanity. Mm. I figured he can't help but pick up some human-like qualities, right? Because he interacts with you, he's got to be able to fake it. So he has to yeah. not only look human, but pass as human, which means acting like a human, which means out of all the entities out there, he's the one that understands humans the most. Most of them don't give a shit, right? Like you're just, you're, you're scum on the bottom of my shoe if I had shoes. Yeah. But for him, it can't be because he wouldn't interact with humanity as much as he does if that was his viewpoint. So I figured just in order to have had that historical impact, he had to do it. So he's got a, almost a very conversational quipping like you can still sense his 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 total sociopathy right oh yeah and total lack of remorse or concern or whatever for you you guys are all just you know pawns nothing. and nothing to me yeah he's very you can like really there's an inherent like condescension to everything yeah. but, everything he says and it came across perfect but i have to interact with you because that's what i do that's my that's my shtick that's what you know makes things fun for me. And that in, in a sense, that's everything he everything is a joke. Right? Yeah. The, um everything is a joke. Nothing matters except for his end goal, which is stop oblivion. Because oblivion kills him too. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like 
so there, there has to be something. They have to have some sense of purpose. And I, I don't know if they did in Lovecraft's earliest stuff. I, I mean, we, the, he focused so much on the unknowingness of... Yeah, the, uh, the whole... Because really, Lovecraft doesn't explain really anything of their motivations or even what they do. Yeah. Um, in his stories, all that really came after like August Derleth came yeah. about and yeah. started expanding on it. And, you know, subsequent authors, Lovecraft himself really wrote very, very little on what these things were besides, you know, abominations beyond yeah. human comprehension. Yeah. I mean, that, that's an easy thing to just say. What, what are they? No, I don't know. It's beyond human comprehension. So don't even try. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay. it's, it is honestly kind of a cop out for, for, uh, well, it, it can be, I mean, I, I think he used it as a device just to talk about the hopelessness. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. Like there, and I, I'm not, yeah, I should, I'm not thinking I shouldn't that. make that generalization. Yeah. Uh, it, it can be a cop out yeah. when someone doesn't want to explain or can't explain something. Oh, it's beyond human comprehension. The, the, Used effectively, it is very effective. The, the the human mind wants to make sense of things, so it fills mm -hmm. in the blanks, which is why people buy into conspiracy theories and stuff like that, right? Because we mm -hmm. fill into the if we fill in the blanks of stuff we don't understand, so. Even when you're, you're dealing with these enti entities, I think part of the reason or, or part of the way he showed insanity or the way sanity um, comes into play in Call of Cthulhu, the role playing game, is when the human mind tries to fill in those blanks, but it can't. Because they're so desperate to make sense of things when they encounter something that just doesn't make sense, they lose their mind. Um, so the entities that I've used have the, the ones that show up and actually interact with people. So Narlathotep and Yogg-Sothoth, they have figured out ways so that you don't immediately go insane because they are using you as pawns, right? Mm -hmm. Like Yogg-Sothoth actually comes across in the four books that are out as fairly benign, he even you know, yeah. takes on the, the the visual role of Adele's grandfather. Adele's grandfather, yeah. To try to, you know, put her at a sense of ease. But he's not the good guy, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, he is not a good guy. Um, he just knows that this is what I have to do to manipulate you to get the end that I want. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the annoying thing about him is, like, okay, Nerlathotep doesn't know what's going on. He's dreaming up these schemes, and he clearly had a multitude of schemes going on. Because when you get to Azathoth, it's not just Adele sitting there. It's beings. All these people around, yeah. That are in the same boat that she is. And those beings are from all over the universe. It's not just Earth. He's trying to figure out what is the way that I stop this oblivion from happening. And it finally falls into place that she's the key and everything else goes by the wayside. But um, so he doesn't know what's going on. But Yogg-Sothoth does. He knows everything. Except the thing <laughs> got a little cloudy and he needed to source it out himself too. But, I mean, that's what he told Adele. But... yeah. Yeah, that, that's the thing, and, too. You can't trust anything he's actually said to her. So if he does say, I don't know, oh, now I suddenly do. Maybe he always did yeah. know. Um, and I, I love the interactions between uh, Nyarlathotep and Yogg-Sothoth. There's not many of them, but when they're there, like, Nyarlathotep clearly hates Yogg-Sothoth. <laughs> he, there's like a, he knows, a real apathy there. He knows that Yogg-Sothoth is smarter than him. Yeah. And it's like an insecurity almost. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know what's going on and you won't tell me. Why will you not share this knowledge with me? This yes. is infuriating me. Like, you could just say, right? You could just tell me right now. <laughs> but you won't. It can make everything so much easier. <laughs> yes. You see everything I'm doing. You know everything, which is also frustrating. That oh, I, yeah. I can't hide anything from you. So everything is an open book to you, Yogg-Sothoth. You know what's bugging me. You know what I, I need to know. 
and you won't tell me and you mock me for it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they, they are like all of the entities that we encounter that, that are kind of anthropomorphized in a way are they're they're all dicks like, and like that's perfect that's how they should be because like you said we to them are just we're the dirt on the bottom of an ant's foot well, like, <laughs> and the interactions that we see are not even necessarily the interactions as they happen like they say in the thing you're i'm talking to you but what i'm saying is not what i'm actually saying it's what your weak little mind has strung together and interpreted in ways oh, that you yeah. can understand right because if they did not put that barrier up yeah your minds your little weak little minds would bleed out your ears and nose and you know you'd be useless to me so yeah. they are um, doing things in such a way that they, yeah. So what we're seeing, what we're reading as the reader, what the characters are actually experiencing is, is a modified dumbed down version of what is actually happening. I mean, it's a, it's a big chess match behind the scenes between these entities and you're yeah. just the pawns on the board, right? That don't really know what's going on. You move where I move you. Yeah. Right. Go where I say go. Jump when I say how high. When I say yeah, jump. Yeah. yeah. And you so you think you've got freedom and that you're making decisions, but you're not. It's all a game. And again, yeah, you're just left to manipulate. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the the madness angle because one of the hallmarks, as, as you said, is like if you encounter one of these entities, it's you're done. You are, you're losing your mind. It's, yep. you are just irrevocably lost, but I like the way that you handled that by making it. So these characters like, and I know it's ambiguous at first. And then I believe it's explicitly stated that like, cause Harjit explains, it's like, Oh, you've been touched by the other. So you will slowly, but surely lose your mind. Yeah, and like it's I I liked how, I like the way you handled that because that's I have a lot of Lovecraftian plates spinning in terms of my own work right now, and that has been one aspect of it that I'm trying to figure out how to I guess navigate through in a way without you know being derivative or copping out somehow. You know? But even 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 though Harjeet has said that, and Harjeet's the the head of the department. Um, Later, it kind of comes out that he may have been lying about that. Yeah. Yes. Right? Because they encounter people. He basically said, you've got like, what, six, eight years tops before you lose your mind. And, but he also says, right, that one of the ways to stop yourself from losing your mind is to keep encountering it, which seems counterintuitive. Yeah. But he says that because he needs them. They're also pawns to him, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of what he tells them, you can't believe. He has a goal, right? Because of his own. Then we see there's a um, the the there's a like a bonus story at in the first two books, and the first bonus story is a, a memo that he wrote about his encounter with the other, right? To give you background and explanation about why he does what he does. And he is so afraid based on what happened to his friends and what he fears for his family. And he's separated himself from his family, right? Like he's divorced his wife. He doesn't see his kid because he doesn't want them encountering this anymore. But his whole purpose of being is, I got to keep them safe. So you guys, the people that I meet, you're just tools, right? I can't mm -hmm. get too connected to you. You're tools. So I will tell you what I think you need to hear to do what I need you to do. So yeah, that, that, so even what he tells them, you can't believe them. Yeah. I, and I appreciate that, that about his character and his character arc as well, is that he is very much presented as like a, a gray character. You don't know 
it, you wrote him very particularly well. Uh, Thank it, you. It, they're all written well, but Harjeet especially to me was, pro- I think probably my favorite character because he is so ambiguous for, for a time. He's very ambiguous in his motivations and his, well, not necessarily even his motivations. His, those are clear. You know what he wants, the why he wants it is a bit, but it's just, there's always that lingering feeling that he is keeping something huge from you. And I think as a, as a reader, you know, he is, but just the knowing that the characters don't know if they can trust this guy yet. He is ostensibly helping them, but at the same time, they know he's not, I don't know. It's weird. Just the way you wrote him was just great. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm rambling. They have a very weird relationship with him. They trust him almost as a father figure. Mm -hmm. Um, but then they don't trust him because they are right. They know that, I'm not getting everything from you, right? Yeah. And and he's open about that. Yeah. Like he he tells them outright. He's like, yes, I'm not telling you everything. Yeah. And like, so then what do you do there? You're like, okay, well, I guess I trust him because he's telling me that I don't know everything. So he's not exactly lying to me. <laughs> and he, he comes across as likable, funny, charismatic, mm-hmm. but with a, a hardness to him that you're like, yeah. He, what happened? He, 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 he walk over my body and just keep smiling right with he he, he might yeah. spend you know, two minutes going oh damn <laughs> <laughs> yeah. lost another one yeah, no, I open the file find my next, my next one. he actually does right he, he goes, yeah oh, i had i had you know big hopes for her oh well yeah <laughs> who's next up right yeah and uh, the fact that he specifically goes out and looks for people who have encountered the other because he figures once you've been um exposed well it's only a matter of time anyway i might as well Mm. use you and i might as well use you to protect other people so i'm not going to find somebody that's never encountered it and use them because you know he's got enough of a conscience there that he doesn't want to be the reason why Although we do, but if it's already happened, yeah. Although we do find out that even though Malcolm had got bowled over by a Shoggoth, he hadn't been. Yeah, and he doesn't become. Forgot about that. Doesn't become and only because Harjeet used. Yeah, that's right. I (laughs) forgot about that. Yeah, that was pretty despicable, man. You really fucked Malcolm up. (laughs) (laughs) Malcolm has a rough go. He does. He does. He was a. Uh, I, I really liked his and Charlotte's relationship, uh, uh, and I believe that was the third book. Yes, um, he introduced until the third book. Yeah. Um, is that the one with uh, Haster? Yes, that was my favorite of all the, the of all the parts of these sto- of these books. The one where Charlotte ends up in the barn or the uh, yeah, I believe it was a barn or a shed or mm-hmm. something with Haster's by far my favorite i loved that one and like that that texas chainsaw style family and the daughter and like all all of and then uh charlotte getting led away through the that was the one thing i had to look up because like usually when you reference a a character or uh sorry like an entity in your books i i know what you're talking about and i because i'm like not to brag i'm pretty well versed in lovecraftiana but um the, the the thing that leads charlotte or sorry charlene away uh through the woods when she escapes i can't remember it even now i can't remember it's like a glow uh, amigo that's it yes that's right yeah and yeah i don't know i just i love the king in yellow i I know it's not lovecraft uh exactly but i i love the king in yellow my next tattoo i'm getting is a king in yellow tattoo actually it's one of my favorite short stories of all time (laughs) and yeah so anyway anytime something connects with that i love it and i I threw Haster in there because I figured there needed to be a direct antagonist to Narlathotep, right? That I I needed to have an entity because I mean everything seemed to be going too well, right? Narlathotep's plan was being executed, and because he's Narlathotep, right? Hey, you, you people, humans, you can't stop my plan. 
Yeah. But oh shit, another entity could. And the fact that it's it's just so petty. I mean, the entity doesn't know Narlathotep's plan, doesn't care about Narlathotep's plan, isn't trying to necessarily stop Narlathotep's plan. He's just pissed at Narlathotep. So you guys, you, What's the uh, fuck with them? you stole my bride. You apparently want these guys to accomplish something. So fuck it. I'm going to stop them. Yep, yeah. my language there. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> right? So I'm going to I'm gonna do it. And it's just like, oh, shit. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. And and they, they just have a, a series of that last um, in the depths of rely is just a a roller coaster for these guys, right? Like it's oh, oh my god, oh my one after another of things. Um, yeah. yeah, that was yeah. I love that. So yeah, the uh, the bride of the yellow king was, I believe, my favorite individual story, but the. After that is the the pyramid in Egypt, yep. and then in the depths of Rilia, and both of those like tr the just the traversal of the pyramid and like how that like the, the the imagery of them walking. I believe if I remember right, it's across a bridge, and there's like these off to the left. It's just like a sheer wall, and there's something in the wall, and I can't remember what it is, but I remember really just that like creeping me the hell out as i was reading it but then the whole like submersible trip down to use the the thing on cthulhu was just like it's not often my heart actually beats faster when i'm reading something but i was just like just what is gonna happen god damn it like when, <laughs> i loved it dude like i and using Use, I feel like Cthulhu is used a lot in stuff and in ways that I don't particularly like. I, he should be completely unfaceable. I figured I had to use Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, once I went down this path, I had to use Cthulhu somehow. He's not the main, because right. he's not. He's not a, 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 a god, right? He, he's technically mm -hmm. a priest. Yeah. Right? He's a very powerful being. And the, the whole, it's like, why did Cthulhu come to Earth? Out of all the places in the universe, why is Cthulhu on Earth? Because Haster, Nerlathotep, yogg Sothoth, they are free to roam the cosmos. They have schemes and things going on and interests everywhere. But Cthulhu's here. Why? Right? Because he's not as powerful as them, first off. But mm -hmm. he's powerful enough. And it, it just all comes into play that there is just a series of events that were supposed to happen. And yogg -Sothoth knows what those events are, because he knows everything. Mm -hmm. And Cthulhu is just another pawn. Right? Yep. And he is going to do something. And Nerlathotep doesn't want him to do it. So our you know, plucky adventurers are the ones that are there to stop him from doing it. And they don't even know why. We don't know why. Right? So, yeah. The, I, I was just going to say, I really liked how you handled once they actually do encounter Cthulhu as he's waking. Um, like, instantly, boom, Malcolm is, I think, it, was it Malcolm? Yeah, it just... It, it, the characters all like start succumbing like instantly, like yeah. at least one of them is dead immediately. And I'm like, that is the type of response a human character should have to a being like this. Yes. And like, just, they are all effectively just debilitated. And the and... only one that is spared that is Adele because mm -hmm. she was sat at Azathoth's side for all those months. Yes. That was the whole purpose for putting her there was to strengthen her psyche enough that she didn't instantly succumb. Yeah, and she could still carry out the yeah the yeah the means to do that. Yeah, I I loved that. And uh, damn, we are actually almost up at an hour here. But I do want to quick talk to you. So uh, the second series, yes, which I cannot overstate my excitement when i i just happened to come across it i don't even remember how i wasn't even searching for it and i saw i was like wait a minute 
I know this name. The so is it Mephibonoth? Mef- Mephibonoth. Mephibonoth. Okay, Mep- yeah. Dog it's, acting up now. Okay. <laughs> I have five cats, and by some miracle, they've actually behaved this entire time. <laughs> This might be the first episode I've done where they haven't intruded somehow. So Mephibonoth was just a series of letters I put together um, for <laughs> the first story of Malcolm. Really? Yeah. So Malcolm um, goes out to Saskatchewan, right, to where they they go into that grain elevator and encounter the rats the rats, yep. Um, Rat King. And Mephibonoth is an entity whose name is just written in that old abandoned train station. Okay. Wait, is that do you reference Mephibonoth in that story? Yep. Really? I don't even remember that. That's so cool. Well, the name is referenced in that story. Um and of course the the new main character, Nev Winston was from the curse of the windsor witch which is actually also another one of those ones that have a special part for me um that and the prequel story of how the windsor witch gets put into the coffin yes like that one it also really sits with me um yeah and actually, that was funny because I just happened to run into a friend from university and his parents were from Windsor. And he was telling me of this story of his when his dad was there, they dug up a coffin for some reason. I don't know why. It was a legitimate reason. It wasn't just guys <laughs> randomly digging up coffins. They dug up this coffin. And when they opened it, there was a body inside that was perfectly intact that instantly turned to dust when the, the air hit it. And I went, what? I'm going to use that. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's not awesome. My story. Like... So actually, his name is Matt Carver, and he's the artist that I reference in the, the Pikmin story. Okay. And the, the, yeah. If you get the ebook version, I think there's actually a link to his website so you can look at his work. That was just as a thank you for uh, um, giving me that idea. So, the inspiration there, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I was done with this whole Cthulhu Lovecraft. I, I had played my, my role. It was over. I was going to concentrate on other stuff, but I just kept coming back to it. Right. I, I enjoyed writing it so much and I, and it, it is far and away my best selling stuff. Um, and the majority of the fans I have are in this genre. So I'm like, I got to keep doing it. So I thought mm-hmm. I liked the character of Nev that I had introduced and we, we know she's being recu- recruited because Harjeet goes into her office and basically says, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse, right, at the end of that story. So I know she's now in the department. So I thought, okay, I'll use her. Um, she's in her 50s and she's a bodybuilder, which makes her kind of unique. Um, yeah. and a former cop. So I just thought she would be interesting. And I had made up this entity because, you know, you, you get a lot of self-important people commenting online saying, oh, you know, you're just a hack. Why? Because you used all of Lovecraft's people. <laughs> like you used Narlathotep, you used Azathoth, you used Cthulhu. What a hack. Use your own stuff. So I went, okay, F you, I will. <laughs> so, and now you're going to get, oh, why isn't he actually just using Lovecraft stuff? Why is he trying to create his own? Yeah. Now you're going to get it the other way. Yeah. So I decided, <laughs> hey, Mephibonoth, I'd use the name. Like, I honestly was just a string of words together, a string of letters together. Yeah. Oh, I, I believe it. <laughs> um, but I had referenced him, so I decided to use him and made him the uh, master of time. And I like the concept of timelines. I guess this comes out of, you know, Avengers Endgame, right? What the the, um, the elder when she's talking to Hulk, right? About yep, uh, the things will all split. Of... So I figured Mephibonoth had created what is essentially a prism where time splits into an infinite number of potential pathways. Because 
Yogg-Sothoth had said to Adele in the first series that time was like a river, but time had already all happened. Like everything that is ever going to happen has happened. Mm-hmm. And they, that's why he sees it all. But because our minds can't comprehend it, time has to slowly play out like a river with different branches and weaves and stuff like that. So then he basically tells her in this series, forget what I said before. It's like a laser beam. And now we've inserted a prism and an infinite number of possibilities have happened. But only one can succeed. Our job is to bring all those infinite ones down to making one timeline again. And this happened in the 1850s, I believe, is when it was split. Yeah. So her new task is bring these timelines together so that only one remains. But you either, again, have we survive (laughs) or oblivion. (laughs) Yeah. You got to figure out how you make it that everything survives. So, again, super easy task. <laughs> yeah. So, there are dead characters that are suddenly back alive, like Harjeet's back alive. Oh, I just gave it away that he dies. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> Harjeet's back alive. Um, there may be other characters that died off early that because because we we also learned that uh, every time nev gets pulled into a new timeline the timeline she leaves dies right it's gone yes so her the original timeline that we have followed through in that first series of three books it's gone it it no longer exists so this is why Old characters are suddenly here. People are in different positions. There, there's a timeline that she encounters that Adele is nobody. Mm-hmm. Right? And we're That's learning right. a yes. little bit more about what's going on. Um, and this Mephibin authenticity really wants Nev as his herald to be the one that ushers in everything. So ultimately, it's going to come down to her choice that, that that'll be the last story of this arc and it will be three books again six six stories per book um and i'm only on the second one third story second book so i've got it to write and i so i know it it just needs to be written and i have a good idea about what the fourth one is and i know how it ends it's the stuff in the middle that i never know <laughs> yep for sure i'm the same way <laughs> well troy thank you so much for talking to me dude i again i love these stories so much it's truly an honor to talk to you like it's a big influence on what i'm working on right now like it is you know what? In no small part extremely influential then that is awesome i you know yeah. as, a, as an author you to hear stuff like that is just now you're probably going to make me go and write that third story now <laughs> I I said this. <laughs> it is uh it's truly selfish on my part i just i want more so bad <laughs> like i i can't wait to see where this story goes um do you any any where can people go if they want to check out your stuff or if they want to uh everything is to just on amazon um okay i've tried to make it available through other channels and it always comes back to Amazon is the best, unfortunately, right? Um, Because I do put them in Kindle Unlimited, so you can read them there if you are a Kindle Unlimited subscriber. Um, The amount of revenue that I get from those Kindle Unlimited reads far outstrips any revenue I get by making it available on other platforms. So it is available ebook, Kindle Unlimited, and in um, print form. There is a a print omnibus of the three books, which is weird because, you know, I make less money off of that print omnibus. People pay less money for that print omnibus, but they still go and buy the three books individually rather than the big print omnibus. So I would suggest if you want to save some money, buy the print omnibus. Um, 
hardly anybody has bought it. I've only sold like six or seven copies of it. But I mean, the the other books I think have sold like 12, 13,000 copies. So, Damn. yeah. That's I awesome. When I read about how little um, some authors sell, like the idea that most authors don't sell more than a hundred or 500 copies of their book. And I'm like, well, geez, that first one of mine is like eight or 9,000. So I guess I did. Okay. Um, did something right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, uh, if they're interested in buying a, a printed copy, I would direct them to the omnibus and it's all on Amazon under Troy Young. And you can find, if you're interested in fantasy and sci-fi, I've got a few there. I wrote a, a, a young adult cyberpunk, um, but I haven't been able to connect with that audience. I don't know why. So it hasn't sold very well, but, uh, I liked it. <laughs> um, but everybody keeps going, Hey, I want more of the fantasy novels. And I'm like, okay, I want more of the, uh, the sci-fi cause they were supposed to be both quartets. Mm-hmm. Um, Hey, I want more of your, your Jimmy story from the guy in Florida. And I'm like, yeah, they, and the Jimmy one actually does sell pretty well. Um, but not as well as the horror. So I keep coming back to the horror, right? Because I'm like, well, more people bought the fantasy book. I would write the second one of the fantasy book. <laughs> Makes it, I get it. But we're writing sure. it, I'm <laughs> writing more horror. And I haven't really been <laughs> writing anything because Baldur's Gate 3 and then Fallout just <laughs> consumed all my spare time. And I, I really need to stop that. Get I'm, right. I'm with you on that. I've been playing way too much Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So oh, I, love I get it. One. I've been foregoing all of my my own writing responsibilities. I, you know what? I'm surprised how many people didn't like Valhalla. I, I know that's what I've been reading, and I'm just—it's by far my favorite one. I haven't played too many of them, but I've played I've them all. My actual favorite is the the most hated of the uh, arc, Unity. I like Unity, uh, the one that was set in Paris. I love that one. Um, but yeah. And I haven't played Mirage yet. I should probably... I played Mirage. That was the first one I played, actually. Oh, really? Because I, mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't like the character because he's a dick in, in Valhalla. In Valhalla? I mean, yeah. He's an absolute dick in Valhalla. And you're like, oh, I get to play him now? To f- what? Figure out why he became a dick? I don't know. I'm not interested. <laughs> Just like I didn't like Rogue for that same reason. Like, okay. He's a, he, yeah. he's, he's, he's a Templar. He's a dick. I don't, you've literally spent all the ones up to this point saying these guys are the bad guys. And now how I, bad these guys are. I get to yeah. play one. What? I want him, I want him to fall off a tree. Right. And it's, it's an interesting storytelling <laughs> tactic, but yeah. you got to handle it very delicately yeah, at the end. But yeah. hey, let's, let's hop over here actually real quick. Cause now we're talking about all sorts of side stuff. Troy, thank you so much, man. I really wow, appreciate thank you, it. Nick. Pleasure. I will definitely be in touch soon, bud. Alrighty. Thanks. Bye.